So we're going to do respiratory drugs. And in respiratory drugs, we have to include some of these viruses that we're seeing more than normal to figure out do we treat them or not. Um, some of them we do treat. So I haven't changed. I still have no financial relationships. So I've had a... Okay, so basically we're going to talk about the drugs around respiratory illnesses, what drugs do you use, what drugs do you not use, when is it appropriate to use medications, um, and then we're going to talk about safety and efficacy because some of these medications have some safety concerns. So our common pediatric respiratory disorders, this is, this is, this is, we're in the middle of respiratory season, aren't we, right? So I hadn't worked in clinic for about three weeks. I had Christmas break. December 22nd, I worked in clinic. The second patient I saw was a two-year-old who coughed in my face. So I woke up Christmas morning with the worst sore throat ever, and it did everything. I had the sore throat for a couple days, then I had the cough for a couple days, and then I had, I mean, it was just like, the ne and then the runny nose started. I'm like, okay, this is a virus. Every day I had to tell myself, this is a virus. This is a horrible virus, but it's a virus. And um, so, it is, respiratory infections are the big ones, um, but we're gonna talk about sort of medications for all of these. We also have to talk about measles, pertussis, and mumps, because these are the other things we're seeing as respiratory illnesses that we used to not have to worry about. Um, viral URIs, uh, rhinoviruses are most common. There's over like 200, one to 200 types of viruses that cause respiratory infections. There's at least 100 different stereotypes of rhinovirus. There's adenovirus, which I think is what I had. Oh, I also had pink eye a couple days. So, I mean, I mean, I had like every single different symptom over 10 days. It was like hysterical. <laughs> Someone says, what is going on with you? Like every day you have a different symptom. I'm like, I know. <laughs> so. Adenovirus does that, right? It has the sore throat and then eyes, anyway. Um, coronavirus, enterovirus. Just remember, kids get six to eight colds a year. I, I don't know how many times I tell parents because they think their kids have an immunocompromised system. You know, they go, oh man, there's something wrong. We just get cold after cold. I'm like, yeah, like six to eight is the norm and they all cluster in the winter months, which is at least one a month. Okay, you just, just talk about it, okay? They all last seven to 10 days, which means they're well about two, two weeks at the most and they're sick again. Their first year in daycare, they're gonna get 11 colds. Just tell them, 11 colds. It's nine to 11, just tell them 11. So, <laughs> and they're gonna get sick every three weeks because they're gonna be sick for two weeks and then they're gonna be well and they're gonna be sick again and that's normal. So just tell them that so that they aren't thinking there's something wrong. And do it with the first cold, so that these first-time parents are thinking, oh my gosh, there's something wrong. Because, of course, Grandma's going, there's something wrong with that kid. They're sick all the time. They're a normal kid, all right? <laughs> okay, so just tell them up front, this is what happens. All kids get 6 to 8. You know, little ones get, you know, 9 to 11 if they're in daycare. Just, just, that's just the way it is. It's all going to last a long time. And if they have a runny nose and cough, they probably have a virus. This, I love this. Actually, we printed these up. We have these massively at our clinic. They're on the walls of the clinic. They're available for handouts for parents. And so when they come in, okay, this is like one day, I'm not kidding, like every patient was like this. Day four, day three or four, they have a cough. They don't have a fever. Their runny nose is really bad. The parents been up all night. And here's where they are, right? I'm like, oh, look, you're right here on the graph. Guess what? You're right where you're supposed to be. And it's going to get better, all right? <laughs> this is where you're supposed to be on day four. You're supposed to have been up all night with that coughing kid because this is the worst of their symptoms. They don't have a fever, so they're right on track, right? I mean, <laughs> If you approach it that way, right, and you just say, this is what's supposed to happen. This is a normal cold. This isn't the worst cold over ever. This is just the worst days of this cold. Next top month, they're going to get another one just like it. And so don't tell them that. <laughs> but if you, if you know the, what you're treating, and you're, and you're not, you're not going to treat them, right? But you have to educate families. So I send them home with a handout because if the dad brings them in, the mom's going, why didn't we get antibiotics? You know, well, this is why, Dad, circle this spot. This is where they're supposed to be. It's going to get better. If after two weeks they still are sick, come back, all right? 
If after a week from now, which is day almost in, they're still sick, come back. All right. Or if they suddenly get a fever out here, that's not normal. All right, that's that double sickening. So explain what a normal cold is. Because if you educate every single one of your families, and we actually follow this as providers and don't give antibiotics, we are actually going to tackle this antibiotic resistant problem because this is where the problem is giving antibiotics on day four for a cold. All right? So get these in your exam rooms. You can print them off. We put ours are color. We have orange and blue lines, and they're really pretty, and they're really big, and they're on the wall. And, and so this is out of the pediatric um, AAP 2012. Um, no, this is the one from the um, uh, this is the one from the Infectious Disease Society. Um, but anyway, you can get this one. Okay, so how do you know you have? A viral URI versus a sinusitis. You don't, all right? Because um, it's hard to diagnose these in kids. Kids don't have sinuses. You can't do X-rays or CTs to do it. Really, it's, there's no. You can't go in there and uh, culture it to see what you're doing. Um, so one of the things that Wall did is she did a study looking at 258 kids. Um, Ellen Wald is one of the people that's, I, her whole life is studying sinusitis, by the way. Um, and, and what they looked at is they did, okay, can you look at them, uh, x-rays? No, they have normal x-rays. Um, basically, what they decided is that when someone was diagnosed with sinusitis, 20 to 40% of the time they had a cold, and it was an uncomplicated URI. And that was just in 258 kids. That's pretty consistent. We think about some 40 to 50 percent of the time, we are over-diagnosing sinusitis, okay, and we're giving antibiotics for no reason. Acute sinusitis is severe. These are the kids that are going to have a temperature, of a high. They're not going to have 100 or 100.5. They're going to have a higher temperature. They're not going to be able to sleep, which. I don't think is a good sign because with that, all of them, the parents are up because they're coughing, right? It's the parents who aren't sleeping. They have green discharge, but it's the severity and the persistence. They really need to have severe disease or the kid that had a fever at the beginning, they're kind of going along and suddenly they're spiking a temperature in this part of it. That is the kid with really sinusitis. They shouldn't, things should be getting better after day four to five. If they're getting worse, that's really sinusitis. Or if it's lasting longer than 10 days to two weeks, that's sinusitis. I would say two weeks because you still got these kids out there that still have a little snot out to 12 days. All right? But so you can treat it, but most of the time we're not, we're over diagnosing and we're um, do not doing what to do. So here is. Our prescribing data, this is the NAMSI, this is the National Ambulatory Medical Care Survey looking at data from nine, the mid-90s to the mid-2000s. Now, in the late 90s, how many of you were practicing? Do you remember those documents, judicious use of antibiotics documents that said don't prescribe antibiotics for colds? How are we doing here? How are we doing? Well... We're doing better with otitis media. We're prescribing less, a little better with pharyngitis. Okay, non-specific URI we have not budged. We're still prescribing at the same rate as when we were told not to prescribe for a cold. It's only 10% of the visits for respiratory infections, but still, that's 10% of the visits for infections we're writing for colds, which we shouldn't be doing at all, okay? This data is really interesting. When we actually go into it, people like put down all kinds of weird diagnoses and give antibiotics in the adult population. So uh, it's, always, it's all about coding too. So if they have a cold, what are you supposed to do? With older kids, you can give them um, decongestants if they want them. Remember, these are sympathetic drugs, and so we're gonna talk about that. Um, there's pseudofedrine and there's phenylephrine. There is um, Topical decongestants, which is actually what I prescribe a lot to the teenagers who are dying from their cold. All right? They're dying. They have to have an antibiotic because they are dying. They look like they're dying. They're laying and they're like, oh, I'm so miserable. Because they haven't slept. All right? They haven't slept because they're stuffed up. 
So give them some Afrin nasal spray, and guess what? They sleep and they feel better, and they really only need it for a couple days because that cold is going to get better, and then they'll, they'll not need it anymore, okay? So I like to use oxymetazoline. It's one of my favorite drugs for older kids. You can use it in grade schoolers if you want. I wouldn't use it in younger kids, but it works, and it gives them, you know really why they're miserable is they can't breathe. So, you know, and you're supposed to use saline washes, but they're not gonna do that. Just remember if you give them oral decongestants that they are a sympathetic drug. They can get tachycardia. They do cross the blood brain barrier so they can get some anxiety and insomnia. Um, if they have hypertension, remember we have all these kids are obese that have hypertension. Don't give them any cold medicine. All right, because it makes their hypertension worse. Um, we there was a voluntary withdrawal of the by the manufacturers in 2007 of the um, infant formulas. Oh, it's really funny. Do you ever get these older moms that go, "Hey, I can't find any cold medicine for little kids anymore. What happened?" You know. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I gave my kid Dimepap too when he was a baby, but we don't do that anymore. <laughs> so it has to do with deaths and um, uh, poisonings. Okay, there's a reason we did this. The calls to the poison centers, the kids that were having uh, uh, toxicity from these were pretty significant enough for us to say we need to get take these off the market for kids under age two. And what happened, this is older data, it's from I think 2010, um, but here's, here's before we took it off the market. Why are these cycles, well this is the winter months, okay? I mean these are the, these are the winter months, these are the summer months. Of course you're not getting any of these calls for cold medicines in the summer months. So here's this winter, here's this winter, here's 2000, we, we make the recommendation, take it off the market, look what happens, it comes right down. So. They're not making errors because we're telling them not to give it. All right, that helps, right? Here's unintentional poisonings, same thing. We're seeing the trend down. I wish someone would repeat this and republish it and see where we're at when we're like seven, eight years out. Are we still seeing this staying down? I think we are, because I think everybody has the message now that little babies don't need cold medicines. And so um, anyway, it, it, it did what it was supposed to do. We aren't seeing the, the poisonings and the toxicity that we were seeing. Um, the ED visits went, um, uh, uh, let me see, ED visits reduced um, overall. Uh, and if we looked at all visits under age 12, it didn't, but it did in decrease for the kids under age 2, which is who we said aren't supposed to have it in the first place. And most of those visits were related to unsupervised ingestions, because that stuff tasted pretty good. Diamond tap, have you ever had that? It was pretty yummy stuff. So, you know, we just get it out of people's houses so we don't have as much unintentional poisonings. And, um, and that was a good thing. Okay, so what does work for older kids? Nothing. Well, no, okay. All right. There was a Cochrane Review published last year in children. Um, they looked at antitussives from three studies. They looked at antihistamines from three studies. They looked at antihistamine decongestants in two studies, antitussive bronchodilator in one study. Um, so they found that in one of those nine studies, there was a satisfactory response in about half the kids compared to 21% with placebo. I mean, 21% of kids get better no matter what, right? We give them placebo, they're gonna get better with their cough, all right? And uh, so, you know, if an older kid, the parent wants to have it, you know, it's possible it could help some. I mean, it, you know, probably won't, but if it makes a parent feel better to give some thing. But that was only one out of nine studies showed anything that worked a little bit, 50%, only 30% better than placebo. Honey works better than placebo over a three-day period in this study. Um, so, you know, give them honey. I, well, what, you know what was really interesting? Everyone's like, someone says, well, my kid doesn't like honey. I'm like, yeah, well, I can, it's medicine. Treat it like medicine. They need to take it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Uh, there was a Cochrane, a Cochrane interview just on honey for coughs last year that was published. It is better than placebo for reducing cough frequency. It's better than no treatment. 
than in reducing the frequency of the cough. It doesn't differ from dextromethorphan in cough frequency. This is statistically significant. And dextromethorphan has a lot more adverse drug effects because it's a drug, okay? So if they're over age one, give them honey. All the parents want is something to give them, right? Give them something. Give them something that's not going to hurt them. So have you noticed now all these smart manufacturers are manufacturing honey cough syrup? <laughs> I love it. I love it. They're so smart. You know, this honey. And I'm like, whoa, it's way more expensive than going down to Safeway and buying a Safeway brand. But whatever, you know, just, you know. So, you know, as long as they can make money, they will. Okay. Evidence-based guidelines came out in 2006. I just was at a meeting this last week at the, um, with one of the authors of this, um, and we were saying, oh, you need to come out. He goes, that, nothing's changed. It's nothing's changed. They're usually URIs. Don't give them any over-the-counter medicines. I mean, it's just basically, we've been telling people this for eight years, uh, not to give cough medicines. Don't give cough medicines. If you give it, if you, so if they have a dry, hacky cough. So you don't want to give it for a productive cough, right? Because the productive cough is to clear the airways. And that's what you need to explain to parents. Junky coughs are not to be suppressed because we want that junk out of the lungs. And that's what I say. That stuff needs to come out of the lungs, and we don't want it in the lungs if it's from the nose. We don't suppress a junky cough. If it's a dry, hacky cough, then we can give them a suppressant. Um, Codeine, we already talked about codeine, but parents go, oh, we want some codeine cough syrup. And I see some older pediatricians, and I would not, any PMP would not be doing this, but codeine cough syrup for the parent, because the parent really is the one that needs the cough syrup, <laughs> uh, you know, because they are not sleeping, and so they need that kid to sleep through the night, so we're giving the kid codeine cough syrup so the parent can sleep through the night. Really, one, remember our talk a couple hours ago about codeine? Just take it off of your prescribing thing, especially if they have a respiratory infection or already have respiratory compromise, okay? So, and dextromethorphan isn't better than codeine, but if you want to give them something, give them dextromethorphan. At least we're not going to have to worry about these ultra metabolizers. But we do have poor metabolizers of dextromethorphan also, and those kids will have an exaggerated effect of the dextromethorphan. Um, and any kid that's on an antidepressant, so all those adolescents, they can have serotonin syndrome if you combine dextromethorphan and SSRIs, okay? So before you get, tell them to use any cough medicine, ask them if they're on an antidepressant or look at their chart, okay? So be sure you're doing that. And tell them, educate them. If you're writing prescriptions for SSRIs, be sure to tell them they can't do cough medicine, okay? So um, be sure, because that, and of course, they're not going to, you don't know who is going to develop serotonin syndrome. Somebody may, somebody may not, but you don't want to be the provider that's written the prescription that a kid now has serotonin syndrome, because guess who gets to sit on the witness stand? You do, when they are suing you for what you've done. So pay attention, okay? All right, uh, there was a 2013 looking at some of the other things. Promethazine. Remember, we used to use that in a cough syrup. Don't use that either. Um, doesn't really work. Ad adverse effects are more frequent in dextromethorphan and promethazine than uh, the control groups. There's no, it doesn't make any difference over placebo anyway when we're looking at things like sleep. And we also, some of them look at sleep, sleep quality of the parent. I like that one. How's the parent sleeping? You know, that's really what we're treating. So, you know, it doesn't matter. Don't give it to them because it doesn't make any difference. Um, dexamethorphan, the one thing to remember is they have a pretty, it's a cent it works in the central nervous system. You can have CNS effects within 20 minutes. And people who are extensive 2D6 metabolizers um, can have euphoria with it. And people who are poor metabolizers can have toxicity with it. So um, that's about 10% of the population. So you do have to worry about dextromethorphan toxicity in some kids and euphoria in others, which is not, we're going to talk about that later too. Expectorants probably won't hurt anybody. 
They probably won't help either, but they're not going to. So if they want to buy the Mucinex because the ad on TV says so, that's fine. You know, it, the, the ENTs like it for chronic sinus infections, so somehow we've decided that, they need it, that people need it for colds. Doesn't really help, but, you know, it probably won't hurt either. They'll blow their nose more. Um, then they get all this loose stuff, and they'll want to give them a suppressant because now they got all this junky stuff that's loose. So, you know, if they want to do it, that's fine. Don't use it for chronic coughs or colds. Vicks VapoRub, I love this one. Vicks VapoRub, we all used it, right? Our parents use it. I mean, we, I mean, you know. So, guess they did a study, and they said that um, it was uh, significantly better uh, than in cough frequency, but only marginally better than getting plain old Vaseline. So, what does that mean? <laughs> Probably was fine. Well, they said people with vapor rub, they were significantly more able to sleep than children randomized to receive the Vaseline but, um, or no treatment. But the parents rated their ability to sleep as significantly better than the parents randomized to the Vaseline. <laughs> they smelt better. So um, they were able to sleep. The cough wasn't better, but everybody was able to sleep better. So if they want to be able to sleep, the cough might be better, but they're going to sleep better, including the parents. So tell them to use Vicks Vapor Rub. It won't hurt them. There, the old formulation of Vicks Vapor Rub was toxic. It was a, a greater strength than if kids ate it. They were poisonings. So some of the old pediatricians were mortified when this came out. They're like, oh, my gosh, we don't want to use Vicks Vapor Rub again. But it's, a, it's a, not as strong anymore, and they'd have to eat, like, like the whole thing of it, you know, to, to be toxic. And I don't think that tastes good enough for the whole thing, and most parents would probably figure that one out. So... Um, it, it isn't as, as worrisome as it used to be, the old formula. So, so if you're going to tell them to do anything for those little guys, VIX. They smell good. They sleep better. May not make any difference in the cough, but they're going to sleep better. And there it is. Yes? They rubbed it on the chest. This was on the chest. It wasn't those. In, they didn't put it in the. Uh, some people put it in the um, vaporizer. But no, just put it on the chest. Just rub it on. Who knows? So, all right, so back to what are we supposed to do? Uh, symptomatic care, fluids. I cannot believe how many kids, they come in, they have these horrible colds, and they haven't had anything to drink all day. And, you know, so, so well, of course they don't. I mean, I had that cold. I had to force myself. My appetite was so suppressed when I had the horrible cold. I had to force myself. I had to make, I, I had to put the glass of water on my desk and, like, you have to drink that before lunch. And you have to drink the other one after dinner, after lunch, because I wasn't drinking and I, I knew it. But so we have to, the fluids help keep things liquefied. And so, you know, tell them your prescription is water. Okay, water, lots of it. Suction those babies out. Show them how to do it because these new parents think they're hurting them because the kids hate it. They go, they don't like it. I'm like, of course they don't like it. Nobody likes to have their nose bulbed out. Watch me do it. They're not going to like me do it either. They're going to be fine, you know. Give them honey. If they're older kids, give them decongestants, but I highly recommend the nasal spray decongestants. You're not going to have the, the central nervous system effects. They'll still sleep better and... Um, like I said, I like Afrin. Afrin is 12, last 12 hours. They can use it before bed, it lasts through the night. They can use it in the morning before school, it lasts through the day, and they're fine. You know, that's in two do and that three days, if they're using Afrin, tell them three days. But that should, their cold's usually better enough by then. Um, and no antibiotics. Doesn't make a difference anyway. Okay, vitamin D in your eyes. There, is, uh, there was a study published in 2013. They looked at serum vitamin D levels in kids. Um, they, uh, lower serum levels had more respiratory, viral respiratory infections. Uh, in, the, in the Northwest, we, we, you know, it's winter. Although this winter, the sun's been shining. We've all been outside, which is kind of unusual. But um, generally, I would expect every kid in the Northwest to have low vitamin D levels if their parents aren't giving them their vitamin D. Um, so one thing we can do is make sure all the kids are getting the normal amount of vitamin D they're supposed to get their 400 a day. If they're not drinking their milk, make sure they're taking their vitamins. So this is one time you can say vitamins do help. So take your vitamin D. 
And, you know, they could just take the Flintstones chewable or whatever. It doesn't matter. The cheap stuff. is what I, Vitamin D is vitamin D. So this did work. It wasn't a huge study. It was only 700 kids. But, you know, if they're, we're, we're supposed to be giving it to them anyway. So it won't hurt them. Um, the other little virus that has been going around, has anybody seen these kids? They're really sick. This is like not just a normal cold. It is kind of a, vi a rhinovirus. It's D68. Um, it's a specific strain. Um, and it can be anything from mild to a very severe respiratory illness till they're on a ventilator, you know? So these kids can just have a like a normal cold or they can wheeze and have difficulty breathing. This likes, it's the more summer fall versus right now, you, it's less likely to see it. Um, the last cases that I could find on the CDC website were kind of in the fall, which is, is expected. Um, uh, this was kind of scary for parents. It was sort of like the mega cold that kids were ending up in the hospital. Uh, but it's just true, especially your asthmatics were getting pretty sick with this. They don't need antibiotics either. Um, here is where it was the worst. Um, it was in our, uh, we saw a lot of it in the middle here, okay? Colorado had a bunch of them, all right? We didn't have anywhere I practiced in Oregon. Washington had a couple. But uh, so this is what we saw through September. This is the latest data I could find on a map like this. What do we do for it? No antibiotics, okay? No antivirals. If they're wheezing, we give them bronchodilators. If they're asthmatics, we make sure they're using their inhaled corticosteroids. They may need some prednisone. They looked at um, a number of different antivirals to see if anything works. None of them have an activity against this one. So they, they, you can't give them an antiviral, so we're just treating them symptomatically. So if, we, if you have this, make sure they're doing good hand washing and that sort of thing. And if you're working in the inpatient unit, these kids, of course, are on respiratory precautions. Um, so, cause, so we can get these really nasty respiratory viruses, especially if they're asthmatics. Bronchiolitis, all kinds of things can cause kids to wheeze. Human metanumavirus, parainfluenza virus, all kinds of things, RSV. Not everything, not everything that wheezes is RSV, just remember that. So um, they could have a non-RSV bronchiolitis. New guidelines came out in 2014. Have you guys seen these? So, do, I feel like this is the do not prescribe lecture. I mean, this is literally what is happening with these things, okay? The AAP has new guidelines. They say to, um, to make sure you're diagnosing it appropriately. You need to look at the risk factors of being less than 12 weeks, history of prematurity, underlying cardiopulmonary disease, um, immunodeficiency. Uh, look at, we do, uh, you, dose, you diagnose it based on history and physical exam. Don't do a chest x-ray. Don't do labs. You don't even need to do an RSV unless you're going to hospitalize them. Okay, so the treatment is don't do anything. Say no albuterol, no epinephrine. If you're in the outpatient setting, no hypertonic saline. If you're in the inpatient setting, you can do hypertonic saline to infants hospitalized for bronchiolitis. That's what the new guidelines say. Have you guys seen these? <laughs> It's like, if a kid's wheezing, I want to give him some albuterol, please. <laughs> Sometimes I just want to run into the waiting room because everybody's wheezing. You know, just run the nebulizer running, and then by the time they see you, you know if they need it or not. So, <laughs> okay. So these are the new guidelines. Oh, I'm going to repeat it because this is hard because you've got a kid who's in your clinic, and they're wheezing, and you want to give them something we can't. So no albuterol, no epinephrine, no nebulized hypertonic saline, um, no systemic corticosteroids, no antibiotics, and if they can't maintain their hydration, give them IV or NG fluids. Yes? What if there's a family history of asthma? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's an interesting case. Family history of that actually seems to be the reason people go, oh, well, you know, the mother has asthma, so I'm going to give them. And they're saying if it's, our, if it's a respiratory virus, RSV, bronchiolitis, it probably isn't going to make a difference. Um, you know, it really isn't. They say no. That's so, but 
it would be really hard for me if I've got a whole family of wheezers and the baby comes in and they're four week old and they're wheezing to not give out Vidrol, right? But if it doesn't make any difference, which it probably won't if it's truly RSV, then don't send them home with Albuterol. Okay? So, it, you know, the old guidelines said give a trial of Albuterol. Now they're saying don't even do that. Okay? So there's a hand up back there. That's what I was just going to say. We would try. Yeah, that's what the old guidelines say. And these guidelines say yes, the old guidelines said do a trial, but don't do it anymore. <laughs> so, I mean, I didn't write the guidelines. You read them. They're at the AP website. They really say don't do it. But I truly, if it's a family of Weezers, I probably am still going to try some albuterol. But if it doesn't make any difference, so we're talking respiratory rate, retractions, O2 sats, if nothing changes, don't send them home with albuterol. And even then, if you send them home with albuterol, probably you're overprescribing because it really doesn't make a difference. Yes? O2 sats are low, yeah. Yeah, they're even saying don't give oxygen unless they're really low. So, yeah, if their O2 sats are low, right, we're not going to, you know. Yes, if you're going to hospitalize them, you could try it, but, I mean, I think you're still going to end up hospitalizing. Yes? Because it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't, if, if it's a viral illness that's causing inflammation in the airways, you don't have the same reactiveness that you do with asthma. It's, you know, I recommend printing out the guidelines. Just search AAP Bronchiolitis Guideline 2014, and they spell it all out. But that's what they're saying. And I think it's because, you know, we, they, the last guidelines came out and said, try it. I think they're moving us all to accepting that some kids are going to wheeze and it's going to be a virus, and we're going to have to just sort of live with it. You want to watch them really carefully if they're high risk. We're more worried about them. Um, you need to make sure they're staying hydrated. Those kids will need to be hospitalized. Watch their oxygenation. Those kids need to be hospitalized. But understand the natural progression of this illness. Are we treating ourselves to make us feel better by sending them home on albuterol? Or are we treating the kid? And if it doesn't make a difference, we're treating ourselves. Yes? So I'm seeing the trend now. We, we have That's right, and that's what the guidelines say. They need to be below 90. Okay, below 90. So um, yeah, and you and you know you just have to get comfortable with the fact that you're treating a virus now. Those little tiny ones, bring them back the next day. You know. Give the parents clear guidelines. These are the things. If they're getting worse, bring them back. We're not saying just send them home to Never Never Land. Follow them closely. Look at them again. You know, tell the parents if they're getting worse or not drinking. You know, they need to come back. You know, set up the appointment. What I do is I set them up an appointment before they leave. You know, I'm like, we're going to, we, we, this is a virus. Bring them back tomorrow. It's going to probably get worse for a day or two, then get better. Okay, so look at them every day. If they give clear guidelines during the day, this is where you go tonight. If they're worsening in the evening, this is the urgent care you take them to. That knows pediatrics, okay? Don't just go to any old urgent care. They're going to end them on amoxicillin, okay? You know, or Zithromax or something, you know? <laughs> All right? So, so be comfortable with this process. And it's going to take us a little while to get comfortable with this guideline. It's a brand new, all right? We got to live with it. We got to see a few kids that get through without albuterol before our gut is going to say, okay, this is when I'm going to be okay with this. It's going to take us some time, but just kind of live with it. Give it a winter or two. Two years from now, we're all going to be saying, oh yeah, I hardly ever do that anymore, okay? It's just going to take us a little time. We got to go away from what we used to do. Okay, prevention is the big thing in the guidelines. Okay, but they've changed the guidelines for who gets prevention. All right, it used to be all preemies. Now they say if their gestational age is less than 29 weeks and zero days, or if they are have hemodynamically significant heart disease or chronic lung disease defined as preterm infants less than 32 weeks who required more than 21% oxygen for at least 
the first 28 days of life. <laughs> so I'm like, oh my gosh, whoa, you gotta read this whole thing and like, okay. So basically they're saying chronic lung kids that were preemies, we used to call it BPD, now it's chronic lung disease, and congenital heart kids with hemodynamically significant, all right? So these are the kids that are getting ready to have surgery. They need it. Otherwise, they don't need it. Um, and then the second year of life, even those kids don't need it. Only the chronic lung disease kids get it. There is a little caveat around immunosuppressed kids. There's not good data on that. They said it probably doesn't hurt. Probably does. We don't know if it helps. It won't go wrong giving immunosuppressed kids um, the uh, uh, synergist. It's not synergist. What is it? <laughs> synergist. Yeah. Okay. I keep getting that one and the one that's the knee stuff, you know, synovus. <laughs> anyway, so anyway, you can give it to them or not, um, but not the second year. Okay? It says you're supposed to give five during the respiratory season. I would just show them the guidelines and, you know, yeah, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, that's always a challenge because you know who's in the office making that decision is some clerk who doesn't have a clue, you know. So you just have to say, look, these are the guidelines I'm following, recommended. This is the kids' diagnoses, and just get the reimbursement that they need. Okay, croup. Um, we have croup. And uh, what time is it? Okay, we're doing good. Okay, croup is uh, croup. We still, we, that hasn't changed. Okay, so we have one thing that hasn't changed. Give them dexamethorphan, dexamethasone, 0.6 milligrams per kilogram. Maximum dose is around 10. Most people stop at around 10. And you can give them oral or IM. How many of you guys are giving the IV stuff? That's the 10 per mil IV stuff orally? Yeah, we're doing that. It's not labeled that way. Here I am, a drug drug person saying, don't do off-label, and my whole clinic is doing our whole system's doing Because it. it doesn't have any taste, and it's pretty concentrated. Um, give them one dose in the clinic. I just have the nurse do it before they go. You can give them or I am. Uh, but I am doesn't make any difference. So why, why give a kid a shot and traumatize them if you can give them oral? Um, if they're really bad, you give them nebulized epinephrine. epinephrine. But if you're giving nebulized epinephrine, you better be sending them for them to be either be admitted or they have to go to the ER. Someone has to watch that kid for four hours because they'll rebound on you in four hours and your steroids aren't gonna work in four hours. Your steroids are gonna take 12 to 24 hours to work. So if you're giving nebulized epinephrine, um, somebody has to be sitting on that kid uh, until at least 12 to 24 hours. So um, that really hasn't changed, nothing new. Just remember what we're, what we're treating here is a virus. No antibiotics for croup either. Okay, community acquired pneumonia. Uh, we talked about this already. We've got a, our pneumonia. We have uh, strep pneumo is the most common cause. This is a guideline that says viruses is probably what we're treating in preschool age, two to five year olds. Um, the one thing is if it, they look like flu and they have a pneumonia, give them an antiviral, not an antibacterial, okay? If they've got, if you're coding for influenza or influenza-like illness, you better not have an antibiotic written there for a five, two to five year olds. It's probably a viral pneumonia, okay? If, especially these flu, that is what they get. They get a viral pneumonia with the flu. That's the secondary infection they're going to get. So um, give it as soon as you suspect they have a, um, a flu so that they aren't getting a pneumonia. And if they've got the flu, trust that they probably have pneumonia, um, that, the, that the pneumonia they have is probably viral, okay? We already talked about the antibiotic choices. No vitamin Z unless they're older kids or younger infants with azithromycin. Um, questions about these? These guidelines have been out for a couple years. How are you feeling about this one? Not giving kids antibiotics, preschoolers. You starting to feel a little more comfortable? I'm still feeling a little uncomfortable. I, you know, I'm, I'm getting better at not doing chest x-rays because they say not to do it unless you're gonna admit them. 
uh, learning to say, okay, I have good ears. I know what a pneumonia sounds like. I don't have to get a chest x-ray, irradiate the kid to say, oh, he has a pneumonia. Because the other thing, too, is a chest x-ray can be look pretty good and it still can have pneumonia because it can take 24 hours to consolidate. So that doesn't always tell you something. So trust your ears. Look at the O2 sats. Are they tachypnic? Make your pres prescribing based on really what you're treating, okay? No one is going to fault you if you give a preschooler antibiotics for pneumonia. What they're going to fault you is if you give them Zithromax for pneumonia, okay? Because Zithromax, atypicals are not what you're treating in that age group. And so if they're fully immunized, you know, you can watch them for a day and see how they do, or you can give them some amoxicillin. You know, no one's going to fault you on that one. In fact, the work that they're doing, they're not even going to touch pneumonia around prescribing guidelines because that's a, that's a defi definitive thing. Just make sure you're prescribing the right thing. No azithromycin. Unless they're older teenagers, those kids can have that. Okay. Um, we already talked about this. Uh, amoxicillin, we talked about this. Atypical, you can test for mycoplasma. The problem is it's expensive. We don't have a good test. As soon as we get a rapid mycoplasma test, does anybody have it yet? I haven't heard of it, right? As soon as we get one, they can cough. You go, you have mycoplasma? Then we'll know what we're doing, right? You know, and, you know they get spit on something and we get, okay, you get azithromycin. And, and otherwise, it's a tough one. I, you know, I was having this conversation last week with some ID people. I said, really what we need is we need a bad adverse reaction to azithromycin. We actually do have prolonged QT. There are some cardiac dysrhythmias with azithromycin. So you do have to pay attention that it's totally not a risk fee. It's just too easy of a drug to prescribe. It's too easy to say, well, you've been coughing for a couple weeks. Let's give you some erythromycin. So this is the decision you need to make. Would you give that kid erythromycin? So you know why we don't prescribe erythromycin, right? It makes them puke, and they get stomach aches, and they don't like it, right? So, so a macrolide is a macrolide. If you wouldn't prescribe erythromycin for what you're treating, then you shouldn't be giving them a Z-pack, okay? You're giving them a Z-pack because you're treating a pathogen that would respond to a macrolide. So your mindset needs to be, is this really a pathogen? Because what we're seeing now is we're getting resistant mycoplasma because we're over-treating. And so the worst thing we need is another resistant pattern coming on. So because we don't have a bad ADR, we prescribe it pretty freely. And so just think, is this really need a macrolide? Would I prescribe erythromycin? Yes. Then okay, prescribe the max. All right. I hate erythromycin. I mean, every kid pukes. My kid puked all over when I had to give him erythromycin once. So I know. So it, it, I'm not saying don't ever do Zithromax, but why are you doing it? And if they have bronchitis, don't give them anything. Okay, bronchitis is a virus. Okay. All right. And that is going to be the big push. I can tell you there's a big national campaign going to come out, and bronchitis is going to be the big one. They're going to say there's no bronchitis from 0 to 90 gets antibiotics. So, you know, it, uh, just to let you know, I didn't even put bronchitis on my slides because we, we shouldn't be giving any uh, drugs for that. You know, it's just a cough. Influenza, um, the people who are hospitalized the most are old people and little ones. So these are young zero to four year olds. Uh, always think influenza if they come in with high fever. Um, the people at greatest risk for complications are our very, very young kids, um, especially under twos. I saw a family of three kids, two had gotten the va vaccine and one hadn't. Of course, it was the youngest one, you know? And I'm like, oh my gosh. So they are getting on the antivirus. The other kids are, you know, they're not that sick. All right. so. How many of you guys are working during Christmas break? You know, right around Christmas? Oh my gosh, it was like every third kid had something. It, they all looked like they had the flu. It was sort of like you open the doors. Oh, flu season started where I work. It was amazing. And they're all this sort of type A, but we have this H3 one here, and then we have the non-typables. Here's our type B down here. So some people that got the vaccine were, were okay. Um, <laughs> 
Okay, so well, it looks like it's going down. This is sort of our pediatric deaths. We've had deaths so far. As of a couple weeks ago, we had had 86 pediatric deaths from the flu this year. Okay, that's why these kids have to go on antivirals. Um, this is the flu season. The triangles is this year, and it's mimicking the 2012-2013 season. Okay, so we it's we're probably getting we probably aren't seeing too much flu anymore. We're getting kind of out there, um, but it peaked almost the exact same week as it did uh, three years ago or two years ago, 2012-2013. It was a little different last year. And then we had that weird one, you know, remember that was the, you know, that peaked way late and all over the place. So that, that was that H1N1 season. So this is kind of a typical flu season. We should be dwindling. We still can see it, though. This was as of February 14th. We still had widespread in the northwest. You guys down here in the south had, didn't have as much. Out there up in Alaska, not as much. Nobody had no reports. We had flu everywhere. So, um, but this probably, if I would have looked at it this week, they get, they want us, our slides have to be in like a February 1st. Clearly, I didn't get my slides in on time. <laughs> but I did push it as out as far as I could. I, this was about the end of February that this was published. So, yeah, we're getting there. Okay, we talked about anagenic drift. Um, we are working on this um, drifting. We don't know what's going to happen next year. Just remember, antivirals. Okay, so antivirals that we're going to give. Because it works. Now, one of the things that the CDC does at their CDC slash flu website is if a they start to see resistance to the antivirals, which we did have resistance to um, Tamiflu a couple years ago, um, they will tell us right in the middle of the season to change. Okay, so always kind of check every year and go in and check maybe a couple times when you're bored, which I know everybody has all kinds of time. But, you know, go and see every once in a while if they change their recommendations because they'll tell you what to do. Um, this is the dosing. Uh, kids, uh, we give them three milligrams per kilogram. If you're giving it for treatment, so this is a kid that actually has the flu, whether you have a positive flu or not, if they look like flu and it's the middle of the peak of flu season, treat them. Even if you have to, you know, and, and so um, those are the ones you code ILI, influenza-like illness. Um, if, cause we don't have rapid flus at my clinic. And so we just treat them. We only test them if we think we're going to hospitalize them. So um, if you have rapid flus, that's great. Then you know that you're treating flu. Uh, and so you treat them for um, five days. If you are treating them, you treat them twice a day for five days if you're treating flu. If you have a high-risk kid that's been exposed, so you've got a kid in the family with asthma and a sibling has the flu, then they can go on prophylaxis. Um, and it's once a day for seven days, okay? And these are at the CDC website. The dose varies. You got to make sure who gets once a day, who gets twice a day, who gets five days, and who gets seven days. It doesn't make sense that you treat the ones who are sick for only five days, but remember, we're treating them for twice a day, all right? So we're, we're doubling the dose. This is a newer one, um, Zanivivir, Relenza. It's an inhaled. Um, you can use this one for seven and up. Nobody with chronic respiratory illness, including asthma, can use this one, though. There's another new one that's an IV one that just came on the market. It's not approved in kids, so I didn't include it here. Flu surveillance, you can look. If you're not sure, let's say you come to, you have been on vacation, you come to clinic, and you're going, oh my gosh, is it flu season? What, what is happening? You can go onto the CC website. Those maps are there. They update them every week, and you can look at your state and go, oh, that's why all these kids look like they have the flu. It's flu has hit here. So that's um, nice to know. You can also see what the prevalent strains are, and you can see um, whether you have resistance yet. So, um, you know, this is where you want to go if you kind of want to know what's happening. Or you can always wait for someone else to do it and tell you. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to finish up asthma here and uh, finish up with asthma and then a couple other things and we'll get out here. It's, I know it's right at noon, so we're going to hurry. Okay, so um, the guidelines haven't changed for asthma, all right? Nothing's changed, okay? You can still use bronchodilators. If they're using it more than twice a net week, they need to be on inhaled corticosteroids. Too much bronchodilator use 
means that they're poorly controlled. We actually have a red bar in our EPIC system that says, pops up, says, this person's refilled their bronchodilator too many times. <laughs> so it's really easy, except for then you have to sort it out. So what do they do? Lose their inhaler? Do they have one at dad, one at mom's, one at school? I mean, you've got to figure it out with a kid, right? You know, so it's sorted out, but if they're using too much, they're probably not well controlled. Um, ipotropium can be used. So think about these kids. Remember, there's a genetically, there's some kids that are at risk for um, uh, possibly not responding to the albuterol. So you can try ipotropium. The thing is, the guidelines say it's used for acute asthma exacerbation and not to use it on, on a daily basis. I had a kid who had a severe sympathetic response to albuterol, which totally makes sense if you understand that. And she got, her heart rate just shot up. And so... We, I ended up putting on our just on ipotropium because it's a different, it affects different receptors in the parasympathetic system, and um, that worked for her. But that was totally off the guideline. But I was like, what do we do, you know? So um, ipotropium. Um, remember, we're treating an inflammatory process, so we use anti-inflammatories. And so we want to use inhaled corticosteroids. Um, this is what is new and exciting. 63% of kids discontinued the use of their inhalers within 90 days of getting their prescription. So, yes, we're prescribing them, but guess what? They're not taking them. And I had a kid who came in, and I, I'm, I'm like, are you using your... I can't remember which one it was. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, so how come you haven't refilled it since August? I'm like, that's four months. I mean, you, you, you know, you should be refilling that like every month or two, you know. So be sure that they're using it. I know we're prescribing it, but make sure they're using it. There are some studies being done right now. One is called the Individualized Therapy for Asthma in Toddlers. We don't have good data. They're looking at inhaled corticosteroid use in toddlers. There's, there are a number of studies where they're really looking at these, getting us better data on kids. But they don't work if we don't use them, and they don't work if the patients don't use them. So we really need to reinforce to use them if we prescribe them. Um, and clearly the data says they don't. They stop using it. About two-thirds of them aren't using them. Okay, next quiz about pertussis. Now that we have this huge pertussis outbreak everywhere, if kids are coughing, you know, maybe kids are doing pertussis tests because, you know, when they, they could uh, they could have bronchitis, they could actually have pertussis, especially if they're not vaccinated. Um, if... They, uh, if we get the symptoms early, we treat them. Um, the symptoms can be lessened and they aren't as contagious. If they're over a year, if we get them within what, three weeks of cough onset and infants yet less than a year, um, within six weeks of onset. So if they're over a year and they've only been coughing for three weeks or less and it, and it acts and looks like pertussis, give them an, uh, <coughs> zithromycin. And, uh, <laughs> and if they're pregnant or under a year, you can give them azithromycin if it's been up to six weeks, and it will sort of shorten the course. Okay, this is the AAP guidelines. It's also at the CD. If you don't have the red book, you can go to cdc.gov slash pertussis, and it has the guidelines. Okay? Go ahead if you're not sure. So, don't treat bronchitis. If you think it's pertussis, make sure that you really think it's pertussis, not just a cough. And you can give them this or max. And if you're going to treat them, go ahead and treat them. Don't wait for the uh, uh, test to come back. Because it takes a while, and they're not always accurate. Okay? But so if you're in California and the kid's coughing, yes, you probably need to treat them because they're exposed to pertussis. If you're middle of nowhere and there's no pertussis in your state, you probably need to think about what you're treating. If they're not immunized, you might think about treating them. You can treat them with a macrolide. Erythromycin, clarithromycin, or azithromycin. If they're less than a month of age, we don't like to give them erythromycin because they have increased risk of hyper uh, uh, pyloric stenosis. So, so you can give them azithromycin. It is off label for that age, but that is the recommended. Um, you can give them septra over age two months if you want to. Most people are giving azithromycin. So this is what we treat pertussis with. How many of you guys have seen pertussis? All right, see, yeah. So I don't even have to tell you. Is this all review? Yeah. Okay, up to six weeks. So you give them 10 per kilo per day. You don't do the, if they're under six months, we don't do the twice as much the first day. And 
less the other day. So 10 per kilo per day for five days. So don't use the otitis media um, dosing, okay? If they're over six months, you do do that. 10 per kilo the first day and five per kilo the other days. Adults, you do that, 500 and then 250. Erythromycin, don't use under age month, 40 to 50 per kilo for 14 days. That's why then a reason you don't want to use erythromycin because they got to take it for two weeks instead of five days. Okay. Oh my, what's that? Okay. So just a reminder that a person is infectious from the beginning of the catarrhal stage. That's the runny nose, sneezing, low grade fever. It looks like a cold until the third week after the onset of the paroxysmal cough, right? So they're contagious for a long time, and they're contagious for five days after the treatment is started. So if the parents say, can we go back to school tomorrow? If you think it's pertussis, no. All right? So um, post-exposure um, prophylaxis, everybody in the house gets it. If you have a positive, everybody gets treated. If it's in 21 days of the onset, and... <laughs> What is going on? Okay, is it time for lunch? Is that what you're saying? Okay, all right, a couple more slides. All right, measles. All right, measles is measles. We don't treat it except you don't give antiviral therapy. There is some data that says you can give vitamin A if you live in uh, another world, like a third world country, they don't get as severe of measles. Best thing to do is give them the shot. Measles. If they're exposed, you can give them the measles vaccine within 72 hours of exposure, and you can give them immunoglobulin within six days of exposure. And the doses are there. This is from the Red Book. You give this measles vaccine six months after you give immunoglobulin. So the measles vaccine, if they're eight months old, nine months old, 10 months old, you have to give them immunoglobulin. Don't give their MMR at 12 months. It's not going to work. Okay, you gotta go six months out if they get immunoglobulin before you give them their MMR. All right, so, so um, that's sort of the recommendations for measles if you get exposed people. If they've been to Disneyland on those days, this is what they get, okay? <laughs> All right, MMR vaccine, we talk about that. Um, international travel, outbreak control. Um, all, make sure all six, so if you have an outbreak in your community, that means all six to 11 months olds are gonna get it. So make sure that you're paying attention to what your local health department is saying, because you may all of a sudden be giving all these babies MMRs that all are gonna need it again at 12 months. Um, oh, and we give the preschoolers a second dose early if there's an outbreak locally. Mumps spread the same way. They're infectious until five days after they get the swollen, no, uh, uh, swollen product glands, all right? Outbreak control, there's a third dose. They may have you give a third dose of MMR. You're going to give your second dose of MMR early if there's an outbreak locally. So all one to four-year-olds get their second dose if it's been more than um, four weeks. And I isolate anybody with no doses of MMR, okay? Because we don't want them getting mumps. And that's it.